<clears throat> We're moving now to the QA session. Um, as you did before, please fill out question cards and we can also uh, pass the mic around. Um, I'll start with the first question for Stan. So you mentioned, well, so the dramatic responses that you've now seen with certain types of leukemia and lymphoma targeting one particular uh, antigen. You mentioned that there was a trial in prostate cancer of CAR T cells, I think it was PSMA. Um, could you speak a little more about the challenges and maybe why that didn't work at least so far as well as one might have expected? Uh, well, I so I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues in terms of um, designing these receptors and uh, validating and identifying the targets. Um, and um, in, in terms of, of PSMA, I mean, it is, uh, it is obviously, it's a prostate-specific membrane antigen. It is expressed on, on, on prostate uh, cells and prostate cancer cells. Um, it is relatively restricted, but not completely restricted to the prostate. Um, so it is a, a, a viable target, but th th there are several issues. You have to have sufficient density of the molecule on the tumor for the T cells to engage. So if you think of, of sort of um, uh, Velcro, uh, if you don't have, uh, you know, one side of the Velcro is, is really thin. It doesn't stick very well. Uh, so you have the good antigen density. Uh, you have to have a receptor that's really optimized. And, you know, we spend often uh, a year or two years optimizing the function of a particular receptor before we would consider taking it to the clinic. Um, I haven't worked on trying to optimize PSMA receptors, so I don't know really the quality of those receptors. And I think that it's something that, um, you know, we, we have to do. Uh, and then I think the third thing is what cells you put it into. Um, you know, we're, we're one of the reasons that we can give these very tiny cell doses is that we select cells um, that have a uh, high proliferative capacity uh, are able to grow very, very quickly. And then finally, they have to get into the tumor microenvironment, and solid tumors are very different than liquid tumors. Um, they often uh, exclude T cells, um, and, and so you have to understand uh, the situation that you're, you're treating. Now, I wouldn't say that, I don't think we've done enough patients, or that, not we, that, that the groups that have been targeting prostate cancer have done enough patients to say that you might not get a, an occasional response depending on the particular physiology of that individual's tumor. But you have to study that. And, and I think that, in my view, in the solid tumor trials that we're doing, um, for example, in breast and lung cancer now, we're going to do as much as we can to get pre- and post-treatment tumor biopsies so we understand what we were dealing with when we put the cells in and how those cells behaved in that individual patient. Did they get into the tumor? When they got into the tumor, what molecules did they express? Were they still functional? And these are the kinds of things you have to do to really build on this. It's it's, um, it's, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, trying to solve a puzzle. Um, you, you have to sort of gradually put the pieces together to get an effective therapy. So I know I went on a little bit long there, but I, I guess what I'm saying is it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Dr. Schweizer, what's the role of checkpoint inhibitors like Keytruda, it's a brand name, in prostate cancer immunotherapy? So the, hello? <laughs> So the, uh, the checkpoint inhibitors like uh, Keytruda, nivolumab, there's a number of them that are actually approved for um, diseases right now, not for prostate cancer. But they, they essentially work by helping to overcome some of the um, uh, immunosuppressive effects that the cancer microenvironment develops. So the idea is that if the cancer is working hard to try to suppress the immune system, these checkpoint inhibitors, as they're called, can, called, called, can interfere with that to help to reawaken the immune system so that it's no longer suppressed and can start attacking cancer. And so uh, Dr. Rydell showed the one figure that sort of, uh, sort of laid out all, a bunch of different cancers regarding how many uh, mutations they had on average. And if you would notice, the, the ones on the highly mutated side of the spectrum are the ones that really respond the best to those types of drugs. Um, there are a few on the lower end that do respond for, I think, probably complicated reasons, but generally speaking, it seems like the ones that are very mutated respond the best. And so prostate cancer, on average, is not very mutated. We've actually recently been looking at a subset of patients with prostate cancer, maybe about 5 to 10 percent of men who actually have very mutated types of cancers. These guys, uh, you know, for whatever reason, accumulate mutations sort of similar to the, the, the burden that you see in a patient with lung cancer or melanoma. 
And our theory is that if you take those patients and you treat them with these types of checkpoint inhibitors, they may respond better. We're in the process of designing some studies to look at that specific question, but that'll probably be maybe next year we can talk a little bit about that. There have been a few case reports of very nice responses, pretty preliminary in these hypermutated prostate cancers. Um, the question is identifying those individuals. So you still have the, the microphone. Um, Mike, are there any uh, current trials open related to immunotherapy for prostate cancer? Yeah, so, you know, the, I, I highlighted a couple that we have here, both vac vaccine strategies. The one is with the, the DNA vaccine for guys with uh, just a rising PSA but no cancer that we can detect on scans. And then another one is looking at men who are otherwise uh, candidates for the Cipulosal T, Provenge treatment, giving them that additional immune booster. Um, those are the ones we have here. I mean, there are other studies out there. Dr. Rydell mentioned the one study looking at CAR T cells. I, I think that's still going on. Um, there are other studies that are, uh, you know, I don't think there's any out there right now specifically looking at checkpoint inhibitors for prostate. But again, I think those studies are being designed right now. Um, I know there's a few trials out there looking at using these immunotherapy approaches early on. So as a therapy that you'd give somebody before they get surgery, for instance. Um, those studies are also still ongoing, and I think the, the verdict's still out whether or not that's going to be an effective strategy or not. Dr. Stefan, how long do cancer cells live, and how long do T cells live? <laughs> how long do cancer cells live, how long do T cells live? Well, um, like regular T cells or engineered T cells, or? Both. Both, either, <laughs> both. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I mean, obviously, you, you're trying to make sure for the therapeutic purpose that you, your engineering T cells that they're proliferating, so that, so that they're proliferating fast on the tumor. You really want to outpace the immune system, and that's one key a key challenge for prostate cancer at a late stage where it's very rapidly proliferating. But the team also I means it's even more rapidly proliferating. So you can't really rely on uh, using some pussycat therapy to, to expand your T cells like vaccine with prime boost, 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 and wait for it. But you need the tiger, and the tiger is making the expand super physiologically using either gene therapy or using bioengineering. And then you want those T cells to proliferate faster than the tumor, not just proliferate faster, but also get to the tumor. But then once the tumor is gone, you don't want them to sick. You want them to contract. You don't want to induce a T cell leukemia and make a patient sick and fill the patient up with engineered T cells that are out of control. So you really want them to still have